Good morning. Great to see you on this beautiful day in February. It is Minnesota, however, right? But we love it. Great warm. And it's a great place to be here together. This warm fellowship on 4th Avenue. So thank you for coming today. The choir is going to sing and open the service with this wonderful promise of heaven when we all get to heaven.
to recognize you as King Jesus today, that you are the Lord, the Master of our lives. We praise you, we lift you today in this place, and we invite the presence of the Holy Spirit to come and work as we've gathered here in your name. And the, deal, the things that are a problem for us, an issue for us today, things that are worrying us or stressing us today, we want to come, Lord, and lay them at your feet to know that you are the one that can help us and take care of us and provide the answers that we need through your word, through others, through prayer, as we gather in this place today. May you be honored and lifted. And we love you, Jesus. We thank you for your presence here today. And everyone says, Amen. 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 Please be seated. I'm going to do a switch of rule. Let's do children's time now, and then we'll do the him after that. So kids, it's time to come up. Now it's time to go to Sunday school. That's Wesley. He's not coming, but he's glad to be here today. This is Brenna and Owen and Annabelle. Miles, the answer man, is coming. Good to see you today. How you doing? Okay, I have a couple numbers today, because I'm talking about the sixth book of the New Testament, which is the book of Romans. It's the sixth book of the New Testament. So my number is six. Is anybody up here six? Brennan is six. Give her a hand, please. She's six. And Owen, you're going to be six pretty soon. And Annabelle, you have been six already. And so is Miles. A while ago, right, Miles? A long time ago. That's like first grade. Okay, my second number is 23. Is anybody up here 23? No. Nobody's 23? Well, I guess I'll have to take that one then. Do you think I'm 23? No. Up or not? Up. You could have got a lot of points from me if you would have just said, okay, you can be 23 if you want. <laughs> Romans 6.23 is a special Bible verse. It's talking about Jesus, and it says, first of all, the wages of sin is death. You know what wages are? Wages? Yeah. See, Miles is up here. He helps so much. He's almost too old to come up here, but I'm really glad he comes. Because he has the answers. Wages is what you get paid. Money. The wages of sin is death. So that makes sin pretty bad, doesn't it? If it causes us to be to die. But the last part of Romans 6.23 is really, really good. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift, you all know what a gift is, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So a lot of times you'll hear Pastor John or Pastor Judy or other grown-ups in the church, they'll talk about the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's from Romans 6.23 because Brian is 6 and I'm just a little past 23. But that's the numbers are not so exciting, though I think it could be kind of exciting to be six, and it would be really exciting to be 23. But the exciting part of that is that Jesus is the one who takes care of sin, he takes care of death, and he gives us eternal life. So here we are at church again, and we've been here before. All of you have been here before, and I've been here before. And it can get to be kind of routine, but we need to remember that the reason we are here is Jesus. Because he solves the problem of sin and death, and he gives us a gift. Now the best gift I ever got, the best gift that any of us could ever get, is the gift of eternal life. And so we should be excited today because we are here to worship Jesus. Who gives us that wonderful gift today. Aren't you glad? You get a gift. You get a gift from Jesus. That's eternal life. Well, let's pray for the kids today as they go to Sunday school. And pray for all of us that we 
experience the gift of God. Thank you, Lord, for Miles and Annabelle. Bless their lives. Keep them safe and well. Thank you for Owen and for Brenna. Bless them too. Every day, may they know the presence of Jesus and his care. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful gift that you give to all of us. Not because we deserve it, but because you love us. The gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Help us to be thankful and to praise Jesus today because of that wonderful gift we have received. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You go to Sunday school. Thanks for coming. Looks like an easy day to me. Just go on to Brennan on the Sunday school there. Some of the best behaved children in the world, aren't they, Cody? They're beautiful kids. And uh, Anna, Annabelle and Miles are staying for a worship service. We have Morgan out there with her mom and dad. And little Wesley is with great grandma Jackie. We, you know, we have a really a great number of redheads in this church. Did you see that? <laughs> and Wesley is just going to fit right in. Well, let's sing about the wonderful story of Jesus' love to us. And today, I read a devotional before I came to church. It was entitled, uh, The Time of Holiness. It's by Pastor Carolyn Moore. She's a United Methodist pastor in North Carolina. And she was writing that we should act like Jesus is alive, because he is. So as we sing this song this morning, I love to tell the story. The story we love to tell is that story, that Jesus is alive. And that should get into our hearts and souls and bless us today. The scripture is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And will you read it with me, please? All scripture is god breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And we are going to sing the hymn, I love to tell the story, it's number 156. We'll see the same stanzas 1, 3, and 4. The words will be on the screen. You can also use the book, as I am. 156, let's stand and sing. Because Jesus is alive today. That's the story.
talking today about passionate faith. And the key scripture that we're looking at is this, the story about the road to Emmaus and a couple of the disciples. This happens after Easter, after the resurrection. Uh, and I just wanted to focus today on there's a, a verse here that says, Their hearts burned within them. And it's a reference to the scripture, or it's a reference to being in the presence of Jesus. And I was thinking about that burning idea. There's the idea that you've heard somebody, maybe one of your parents told you when you were a kid, you got that money in your pockets of burning a hole in it. It's kind of that passion, that drive. Or maybe you got that burning in your heart for that new mate, somebody you're going to marry, that first kiss. Maybe there's that passion for that brand new truck that you've been dreaming about to purchase. Or it's a vacation trip, or it's just something you're so passionate about, something you believe in. I want you to think about that today. What does your heart burn for in this world, or in heaven, or I just want you to think about what are your passions? What's driving you today? What's a burning force within you? And I'd like us to consider that in the relationship to our faith today. That we want our faith to have, have that burning, that passion within our lives that formulates and directs and guides and forms everything in our life. That that's our basis, our grounding. The setting of this text is the resurrection. The women have gone to the tomb. And they've come back and said, we've seen angels. And they've said, Jesus is alive. He's not in the tomb anymore. It says, they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Well, who could believe? Have you ever seen anybody raised from the dead? Well, Jesus did talk about it, didn't he? But still, it was so unhuman in our understanding. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 24 today, and we're going to just work through the, the passage of Scripture. And I'm just praying that this will help us understand a little bit more how can we grow our faith? How can we take that next step in our relationship with God? The first verse on 13, it says, Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles away from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Two of them, disciples, they were journeying from Jerusalem, and they were going to Emmaus, about seven miles. They were getting out of town, perhaps. You know how it is when you want to get out of town, things have just been hard, stressful, worrisome, and you just got to take a trip and you got to get out of town. So much had happened for them in this, this uh, somewhat quiet time away as they were traveling away, just the two of them, maybe good friends. As they were hearing reports, news reports, and people talking, it seems they had almost gone through like this earthquake experience about Jesus and the death and the resurrection. They were stunned. They were physically and emotionally bruised because they didn't quite understand what the world is happening. What's going on? As they walked, they were sharing. They were talking with each other about everything that had just happened. You understand that. We do. We enjoy calling up a good friend and say, hey, have you heard this latest is really bothering me. What can we do about it? How can we share our hearts together? You know about that? Yeah. Slide 2 says, As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself showed up. He came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. This third traveler, they didn't even know it was Jesus. They were so focused on this turmoil in their lives this lack of understanding what was happening in current events, so to speak. They just couldn't understand or even recognize it was Jesus. But he graciously walks with them and listens to their animated, perhaps heated, conversation about the things that had just transpired. No doubt they were quoting various Old Testament prophecies and trying to remember what Jesus had taught them. 
But they just couldn't put it all together to make sense in their minds at this point. Was he a failure? This Messiah, so-called Messiah, that we thought he was coming to change the world. Why did he have to die? Will there be a future for our nation? And this third traveler asked them, in verse 17, he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still. They stopped walking. Their faces were downcast. And one of them named Cleopas asked them, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things, he asked, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. Do you think Jesus didn't know what they were talking about? Jesus knows all things, doesn't he? But in the sweet, gentle way that Jesus works even in our lives today, he wanted to not condemn them for their lack of faith and understanding, but he wanted to draw out what was in their hearts and let that be heard by themselves as well as by Jesus. But he wanted to help guide them and lead them, sort through what seemed like faithless and lack of understanding on their part. But you see, Jesus, if I can just throw this in for us today, he so cares for us. He comes along, walks beside us in our doubt, in our grieving, in our lack of misunderstanding or understanding. You see, these disciples thought Jesus was doing more than what they could see. And he, but we had hoped, they said, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped that he was going to redeem Israel. But now their faith was shattered because he, he died. He was in the tomb. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. So they had some knowledge. The third day Jesus said he was rise again, but they couldn't quite understand that humanly. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. That would have been Peter and John. You see, these disciples knew about what Jesus had told them before he died, but they just couldn't get their head around it. They thought he was still gone. They said, yeah, he's a good prophet. And he said he did these miracles and things, but we had hoped... You see that? We had hoped that he was the one going to redeem Israel. These men seemed hugely disappointed. The Messiah? Maybe he wasn't. Maybe he was just a good prophet. They had hoped he would free them from the Roman rule. The troubles of their day. The wrong political leaders. The agony of an evil, evil world was now more than they could handle. We had hoped that he was the one. Then Jesus begins to speak in verse 25. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. I don't believe that this was a strong rebuke. I think this was a gentleness of Jesus saying to them, you maybe aren't quite understanding. And he did call them foolish. But it doesn't seem to indicate they were offended by that. Because then he began to explain to them what the prophets had prophesied about the Messiah coming. His suffering, his death, his resurrection. And they were slow to believe, slow to understand, weren't they? Just like we are sometimes. Jesus claimed all the prophets as his witnesses. 
He was telling these men that the Old Testament is fulfilled in the Messiah, and they would be comforted to know the prophets and believe them. Remember their walking. How far? Seven miles? How, how fast can you walk? About in a mile, can you cover 15 minutes or is it 20 minutes? 15. So if you're going to go seven, how far are you walking? A couple hours, two and a half, three maybe. If they stop once, you know, they're so animated, their heart is heated over, so to speak, about these details, they might have been lingering kind of along the way, stop and talk, or maybe they even sat down a bit. But seven miles is quite a ways to be walking. They probably didn't have McDonald's or a Starbucks in the They might not have any place to stop, really, but they were walking. This weary road. And as they continue to walk, it says in verse 28, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further, but they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is near, nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Notice Jesus wasn't forcing his presence upon them. He was ready to go on except at their invitation. It reminded me as I was preparing this, that picture of Jesus standing at the door, knocking from Revelation 3.20. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you open, I'll come in. But he doesn't force through the door. He doesn't barge into our lives. He invites us to open the door, to come in, to sup with him. It seems these men seem to not be able to get enough of Jesus and what he was saying. And remember, they still didn't know who he was. They didn't recognize him. And apparently their eyes were not open to see him right there beside them. Have you ever had that problem? Sometimes we don't recognize Jesus right there by us. When we don't understand, when we're disheartened, when we don't know what's going on. In verse 30, it says, when he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and began to give it to them. What does it say then? <clears throat> then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Isn't that interesting? As soon as they recognized him, he disappeared. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Would you read that verse with me, 32? Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? There's something powerful, friends, about scripture when it's open to us, when we understand what we're reading. Because Jesus is in those pages. And he comes to reveal himself to us. As they ate together, their eyes were open. They recognized him. And Jesus immediately left. Because now they could see. Now their faith was anchored. They understood the truth of the Old Testament being fulfilled in the new. They understood that it was Jesus himself, that Messiah, the prophet, the Lord, the Master. They knew without a doubt that he had truly risen from the grave. There he was, right with them. They saw, their eyes were opened. They understand that human understanding falls short of the truth of God's word and God's plan at times. We don't see, we don't comprehend. After Jesus left, they talked with each other and tried to explain what happened. We're not our hearts burning. You know how it is to have your heart so passionate, so overflowing, just so moved. And this is what was happening to Cleopas and his friend, the followers of Jesus. Now what do these guys do next? I think this is really interesting. I would use the word cool, but it's not supposed to be so in your, in your vernacular. No Notice what these two men did next. When they realized it was Jesus who had risen from the dead. And he truly 
was alive. And they heard the scriptures. They began to understand. They saw. Their eyes were open. Verse 33 says, They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. I don't know if they even ate supper. I think they were so excited. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. How far away was that? Seven miles. Man, it seems like you want to eat supper first. I don't know if they did. They were so excited. There they found the eleven. Those are the other apostles, the disciples of Jesus. And those with them assembled together and saying, It is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. They were so excited. Their lives were impacted deeply. The scripture anchored in their hearts. Their faith was renewed and reinvigorated within them. And then the two told what had happened on the way. They shared that message of excitement and truth and faith. How can we apply this story to our lives today? Has your heart burned for God's word, for his presence? As you hear Jesus speaking to you, those sweet words of comfort, it's going to be okay. I'm with you always. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Those words of comfort and peace. Our hearts burning for many things we're passionate about. A newborn babe. A burning heart for a dear friend who is suffering. Maybe some of you are passionate about hunting and fishing. I have a friend who's, who's quite passionate about hunting and fishing. You know, our hearts are burning within us. But I hope that we have hearts that are burning with a passion for God and for His Word. So that we can have Him right beside us as He speaks to us through His Word. When we are seekers of God, our hearts will burn within us as we are with Jesus. Because He's right there with us. His Holy Spirit works in us. We know His promises. He's working all things out for our good. One of the scriptures in Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the Word of God. Your faith will increase as you spend time reading His Word. That's the promise of scripture. To know who He is, that author of our faith. On your handout in your bulletin this week, on the inside, if you want to fill in these answers for later this week, as you may be reviewing and finding some encouragement in your faith as, as you study and as you read the scripture, the first one says, the more we will read the scriptures, the more we will see Jesus. And there's that verse. Faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ, Romans 10, 17. <clears throat> These two, on the road to Emmaus, struggled to believe the events of the day. <coughs> and what they knew, Jesus had told them, and yet they still struggled to hear the truth. They did not believe all that the prophets had written about the Messiah. They only saw part of that picture. Most of the Jews in that day saw Messiah as the conquering Redeemer, but they didn't see him as the suffering servant. They saw the glory, but not the suffering. They saw the crown, but not the cross. These men had talked to Jesus and listened to Jesus, and when he made as though he would go on alone, they asked Jesus to come home with, him, with them. To be with him. The more we see Jesus, the more we want him in our lives. The more we want him in every aspect, every detail, every moment of the day. Their hearts were burning within them. As we think about the number two, the Bible will open our eyes to Jesus. All scripture, that one we said earlier in the service, is all scripture 
is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. There's another passage in, in Hebrews that says the word of God is like a sharp, double-edged sword. Cutting between the soul and spirit, between joint and marrow, it exposes our innermost thoughts. It brings to our understanding the feelings, the, into, in, the attitudes of our hearts, and helps us understand as the spirit works in us to help us correct us, rebuke us, encourage, strengthen, whatever it is that we need that day, the Lord works through his word. And number three, when we are filled with God's word, we look for ways to tell others. Last week when Dwayne was preaching, he asked that we would each share the gospel or talk with someone about our faith this week. I hope some of you had that opportunity or took that opportunity. But this is what happens, isn't it, when we're passionate. I know I saw my dentist this week. And I always enjoy going to see them, not because it's the dentist, but because they are people of faith and they kind of want to give me a hug. And we always talk about the Lord. We talk about what's happening in the world. We talk about their faith and they ask questions and we just share together. It's a wonderful opportunity to share our faith with others. And when we're filled with God's word, we look for ways to tell others. These two men immediately left the supper table to go seven miles back to where they had come to say, we've seen him. We understand now he is alive. He's living within us. It's true the Lord has arisen and appeared to Simon. This was important. This was Peter who had run to the tomb, who had also forsaken Jesus three times, failed to say, I know him. And now they were understanding Peter is accepted again. He's going to be okay. He has seen the Lord. Perhaps today, you might have some discouragement in your heart. We have, that happens to us, doesn't it? We get discouraged. Things aren't going like we hope they go. Issues come up. <clears throat> some problems seem insurmountable. Bad medical injustices that are done, financial stresses, broken relationships, shattered dreams. Just yucky days sometimes. These men were walking along the discouragements of Jesus came beside them, encouraged them, strengthened them, opened the scriptures to them. And their discouragement turned to joy and excitement. In Psalm 84, it says that the scriptures, that scripture of Psalm 84 says that when we walk through the valley of deep sorrow, it turns into a pool, a spring of refreshing water. Somehow God takes those challenges, those hard things, those, the lack of our understanding at times, and turns them into things that refresh us in the long run. Builds our faith. We become more people of character. Not the get-even kind, but the, the kindness we offer to others who have maybe been hurtful to us. We act more like Jesus the more his word is within us. We begin to see more of truth. We are led by the Spirit of God. God's word is the anchor for our soul and the joy of God's presence. Food for our life. Light for our path and direction. And when I'm afraid, we find that solace, that comfort of God. I want a passion, a burning heart for God's word, for his presence, and his love every moment. And I thank the Lord for his word to us today. His presence with us, his help, his love, his kindness. On your next steps in your uh, connection card, on the back there it says, I want my heart to burn with passion for God. I do. And sometimes it kind of waves, you know, goes up and down sometimes. There's those moments that God speaks so in such encouragement into hearts and minds. As I read it, it sometimes 
is like the, the words stand off the page of what I've needed an answer for. Or maybe what I needed to be poked and say, hey Judy, your attitude's not right there. The Holy Spirit works in me or encourages me. Sometimes it heals me. Gives direction. So the second one is says, I will read my Bible every day this week. I hope you will make that a goal this week. Start with a psalm. Those are short if you don't have time. Take a moment, a minute with God in the morning before you go to work. Or take it over lunch break or in the evening when you have time before you go to bed. Take some moments that will bring encouragement and strength to your faith. If you hear his word, it builds our faith. The third one says, I will look to Jesus in everyday details of my life. And the last one, would you help this week as we share the message of God's goodness? That he is alive, he is with us, he loves us, he comes alongside of us to help us. Whatever we're facing, if we're disheartened, we have faith in Jesus. I will tell someone about Jesus this week. And you don't even have to go seven miles to do it. Right? Maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe it's your person that you sit with. Sit by next at next to work. Try that again. Sit by at your workplace. Someone needs that encouragement from you this week. Be open to, your, to let your spirit work through you and help that happen. Let's pray. Father, help us today. By your spirit, work in our hearts. Lord, you know that often it's discouraging and there are some things that are stressors. There are things that are hard to understand. And Lord, as we push into, as we lean into you and your word, we will find that comfort, that faith, that passionate faith that you long for us to share with you. So we pray today. Not what my words can say necessarily, but by your Holy Spirit to work in each heart and life in this place. That we will seek you, that we will love you, that we will be open. Open our eyes, Lord, to see you. And that the word of God will speak to us life and strength, health and nourishment and encouragement and faith today. And these days forward. In Jesus' name we pray. for us to worship God by giving. The ushers will serve us this morning and bring the plates by for us to put in our offerings and please put in your connection card as well. Lori is singing the offertory for us. God bless you as you sing, Lori. And may the word of God work in us.
Would you stand with me and turn our hearts to the Lord? And now we join our voices together and we pray these precious words together. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And our benediction, together. May you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. God bless you.